and welcome to Clamp, the weekly podcast where we talk about all things related to creating, living, and making projects. I'm the host, Grant Alexander, and joining me as always is Adam Mackey, and returning this week from a wonderful vacation in Cape Cod is Morley Kurt. Yo, yo. Today, we wanted to talk about something, and I'm going to throw it to Morley to talk about that something. I think you do this just to see if I remember what the topic was. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about it in the pre-show either, so good luck. <laughs> um, what was the topic? It was... It was your doing- topic. I know, but just pre-show, show, go. <laughs> no foreplay or anything. So... <laughs> <laughs> I think it was actually I think the problem is is that I wasn't really comfortable talking about it and I wanted I couldn't get out of my comfort zone to to introduce the topic so I thought I'd throw it off to you but I seem to have gotten out of your comfort zone as well. <laughs> well, it's good because doing uncomfortable things I think is one of the best and most helpful things we can do. So, I thought of the topic that topic for this week, because in the last few months, I've been doing a lot more public filming. And in the first day where I did every uh, video every day for five days, I talked about how I'm kind of uncomfortable naturally doing that, how it feels kind of like, for lack of a better term, kind of cringy to be filming myself in public. You know, like I have associations about that with certain personality types that I might not want to associate myself with. But the experience of doing that, you know, it was never comfortable the first few times trying it. I just had to do it those first few times. And through that experience, it's slowly allowed me to get better at and more comfortable doing it. But every time I do it, when there's other people around and I'm filming, it's still something um, I have to sort of get over uh, because it's uh, just there's something about it which is difficult for me. But I think it's important to continue doing because i think it adds so much to my videos being like out and about and having other people around and capturing those more genuine moments on like a little bit of an aside about public filming a lot of people post on the internet like oh instagram models public filming blah 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 so cringy and i i'm gonna hazard a guess that those people are also like oh it's really cool they're filming a tv and show in her in my street it's like why is that like one form of entertainment totally cool because it's professional and then the other person who's making a living on YouTube or Instagram totally cringy they shouldn't be out there like it, it's it's funny you say that because I've had this argument with my wife so many times of like she'll binge watch like the Kardashians but then I binge watch someone on YouTube and she's like why are you watching YouTube like that's ridiculous I'm like you're literally doing the exact same thing just because it's on a different format or platform it's the exact same thing I think something that helped me feel a lot better about it recently was uh, two days ago Eden and I filmed a test run for the off-grid 3D printing station which by the time this episode comes out that video will be out and then Thursday of this week on September 15th we're going to a park and we're doing free 3d printed repairs from the off-grid 3d printing station and so this was all public filming this was probably the most youtuber over the top thing i've ever done in public like i was pushing around (laughs) a huge cart with a 3d printer and like a one wheel strap to it and eden was following me with the camera and you know there was just a lot of stuff going on it was taking up a lot of space (laughs) like people had to move move on the sidewalk for us to get by But we got so many smiles because I think altogether, it was a very wholesome thing, a very interesting thing. A lot of people like did a double take as they walked by and were like, what's that? And, you know, it was very inviting for people to come over and like ask us what was going on. It was, it was very reminiscent of like walking a puppy around a lot of people, just Mm. strangers smiling at you. And I think that experience in general helped me feel a lot better. And on top of that, just the last few months, I've met so many more of my neighbors because I film with my garage door open, usually the camera at the door filming into the garage and people are walking by all day. And most days I see the same people. And when you see the same people every day, they start talking to you. And um, Adam and I were talking in the discord before we recorded this episode about feeling a little uncomfortable when people walk by while we're filming. And that's still something I struggle with. Like 
if I'm recording something and I hear someone coming and then walk by, I'll stop because I start getting into this thought loop of like, oh, like, yep. do I sound silly? Do I sound weird? And then because that thought has entered my head, it kind of like breaks up the the train of thought and I have to sort of restart. Um, but right across the alley, there's like contractors that have been working on the house for like two months now. So I see them every day. And the guys even like come over and talk to me about projects. He showed me pictures of his. He let, he let me try out his really nice pass load uh, nail gun, which I would highly recommend. That thing, like the combination electric and gas powered ones, absolutely amazing. Um, so just having those like positive interactions has made it feel a lot better of like doing this YouTuber thing in public. I have so much to talk about what you just said, but um, like with the neighbor thing, I do the same thing. Like my neighbor comes out and like, they're just gonna be like, what is this weirdo doing talking to, to himself? Like they don't really see the camera. They just see you talking to like open air pretty much. I think if you're alone, it's a lot more awkward. Whereas if you had someone else there that you were talking to, it wouldn't be so bad. Hmm. Um, but I, I wonder, so you said that Eden was following you with the camera, right? Do you think it's more awkward to film in public yourself, like holding the camera selfie style or someone following you around with a camera? Oh, it's so much easier when someone is following you. Cause then, like you said, it's like, you're talking to another person and like, I like Eden, I think like looks cooler than I do. So like just being with her and talking yeah. to her, I feel like, <laughs> you know, sure, I feel yeah. like a little more like socially in a better position. Um, yeah. So a hundred percent, it's way easier with another person. And I think like, again, in that video, like the day one of making a video every day for five days, when I'm talking to Eden about feeling uncomfortable about this, she kind of helps me work through it in that. Like, what would you think if you saw someone filming themselves and eventually as we were talking mm. through it, I was like, well, I probably wouldn't really judge that person. I might do a double take, but at the end of the day, I would be like, cool, they're doing their own thing. And that doesn't really impact me. Probably wouldn't even go that far into that thought. You'd probably be like, oh, and like, that's the amount of, yeah. like, you would, like, it would be like, yeah. a, not even a vowel would come out. I, I, I feel awkward enough, not even like filming myself, but just filming in public in general. Like I, I rode my bike to, um, it was a boat ramp and I was taking pictures of it and filming around it. And I'm like, people are going to be driving past going, look at this idiot taking pictures of his motorbike. He thinks he's so cool, but like not even trying to film myself or vlog or anything. Yep. I don't know. But yeah, I, um, actually in one of my videos, one of the motorbike ones, I think it was a motorbike one. No, it was the clamp rack one. I, rode to Bunnings and bought stuff and I left the camera on, on my motorbike helmet and I like hid the camera under my arm so I could film like while I was walking through the shop. Cause I didn't want people to know that I was recording. Then, then now next time you got to just take the, uh, the full camera and walk around with it. Got to keep pushing yourself to be more and yeah. more, you know, just out there with it. And you know, it's funny that what actually inspired me about this topic was a TikTok that I saw. And it was basically someone summing this up, you know, you have to do uncomfortable things, but the way they said it was, um, you have to accept that the first time and maybe the fifth time will always be hard and uncomfortable. Like it's never yeah. going to be easy the first time you try something new. And that means that there's not really, a, you know, the, the discomfort itself is not a good reason to not do something because you'll never get over that until you actually just do it. I've always heard that the only way you can grow as a person is by going through uncomfortable things, like doing something like growth comes from uncomfortableness. Discomfort yeah. is probably a better word. Yeah. Growth comes from discomfort. Edit that out. Growth comes from discomfort. No. Uh, you don't have to edit that out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think, I think too, like in today's day and age, like specifically talking about filming in public, like you have a phone in your pocket now. Everyone has a phone in their pocket. Everyone's taking pictures and stuff and getting your phone out and recording yourself is one thing, but walking around with a massive DSLR, like holding it out in front of you, like trying to vlog, I think is like people are like, well, that's unusual to see, especially where I am. I think in America, like, there's so many like YouTubers in America, like LA and stuff. You probably see people 
everywhere holding a DSLR in front of them. But if I saw someone walking around with a DSLR in their hand, I'd be like, what the hell? Like, this is so weird. It's funny, like Toronto is a really big film town and there's a lot of actors here. There's a lot of like aspiring creatives, probably not as, as many aspiring YouTubers as LA or New York, but I don't think I've ever seen someone walking around with a DSLR. I've been that person yeah. like filming myself, but I don't think I've ever seen anyone else do it. It's probably if you did see them, your reaction was, uh, and that was the end yeah, of it. And you it never probably didn't of it register. Again. This is basically the spotlight effect in a nutshell. The fact that we assume that everyone else is thinking about us, where in reality, everyone is just too yeah. caught up in their own problems and day-to-day -day stuff to think exactly. about what, whatever you're doing. Yeah. But even like, even if you watch people that like vlog in public and stuff, you never see people in the background vlogging. Well, not <laughs> I that I, so. I really noticed anyway. Like, I don't know. It's such a weird thing. Yeah. It's because as you're walking around, you see the other vlogger and you make, and you turn. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. so let's, let's try and change most people. Hopefully I mean, a lot of people that we, that are listening to us don't create content in that way. So is there ways that in your making that you've gone outside of your comfort zone and into something that you went like morally, I can think of the, the lectern and, and Adam, I can think of the van build, right? Where you, you kind of took on a project that was potentially something bigger than you had done before yeah. or to I a mean, level that you didn't want, didn't, hadn't done before. Yeah, well, I mean, like the, the van build and also the Land Cruiser build that the video is never going to get released, just so anyone who's wondering for it. Um, they were big undertakings of things that I had never done, but they've also given me the motivation to get the caravan done that I've just bought. Now, the caravan has a lot more to it than like a little van that didn't require me to run power and all that sort of stuff. And with the caravan, like I haven't started on it because there's so much stuff that I need to research first. Like I want to make sure that I do it correctly and to code and make sure that everything's done right. Because once those walls go up, they're not coming down. I think like many makers, a lot of my projects are doing something for the first time. And I also think that's what makes for a lot of the natural engaging moments in my videos. And I was thinking about for this sure. today with, um, you know, so I did the pallet coffee table and then I did the pallet desk. And there was a lot of very genuine moments in the first pallet table because I had really never done a project like that before. And then the second one I think was, in my opinion, a better video because I did a, the very similar thing and I learned from everything I did from the first one, both in the physical making and the camera work. And I think was just able to come out with like a better end product, but it didn't have the same genuine moments as the first one, because like, I kind of knew what was going to start happening. And now, and I've been right. thinking recently about like, you know, cause I get all these comments about people saying like, well, like do more pallet project with the, with the next pallet table. And I, I do want to do more pallet projects, but I also want them to be very different projects because if I do a similar thing again, like there's, it's going to be so predictable that the video won't be as interesting. And so I'm trying to be right. cognizant of the fact that those unpredictable events make for like really interesting content. Right. And it's the same, it's like when you see people get stuck in building more and more tables or more and more, whatever they're building, they might even be making better and better tables, but I feel like they're not getting into the growth zone uh, of their mm. craft as much. Like there's diminishing returns because you're not getting into those uncomfortable bits. Like when I think about the first, uh, coffee table to the desk, the thing that was different is that you were trying to make it for a person who had already agreed to buy it. Yeah. That was the part that made the video more interesting than the first one. Um, in my opinion, right. or like made it different. Yeah. Cause yeah. in the end, imagine if Mackenzie had got in there and went, this is garbage, right? Like <laughs> I hate it. Right. Like what would you have done? Like that would have been like, that's what the could have happened at any point. They could have went, nah, I changed my mind. Well, here's a little behind the scenes, right? So I'm working on another project right now and Mackenzie is likely going to buy it. The same Mackenzie who brought the pallet desk, but he wants to see it finished before he commits. He, he said he's at like 90% now. So there is a chance that he's going to see it and be like, 
nah, I'm good. <laughs> you don't so, like uh, I'm a little that. nervous. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, it's probably going to happen through like an Instagram message. But, no, no. Um, Scri- like literally what you need to do is script that. Script it. <laughs> Tell him to say no. And then like, ah. And then big not sold. You know, $5,000 not sold. And see if it if it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, Anyways, what about you, Grant? Well, like, I don't know. I, I generally find that, like, I think, I don't know. I get, like, I get, so my, like, comfort zones have to do more with people and uh, real life mm-hmm. situations of, like, trying to talk to people. And I've, I, I often try and, like, I just have to work myself up to do it. Like, I remember when I, it, my memories on Facebook today were of uh, Maker's Rendezvous which was put on bear, by uh, Bear Mountain Boats. And they did it in the little town outside of Ottawa. And that's where I met Andrew Zito and Pat Lapp and Jimmy Deresta, Um was like at that event. Um, I'd been talking with Pat before that, but like I met them in real life for the first time there. And like I had to like really psych myself up to get to that event because I really – felt uncomfortable going there and being like, I'm going to go talk to this guy. I've been, you know, talking to (laughs) online and all of a sudden, uh, is he going to say something like, am I going to say something weird? Is he not going to like me? Is it going to be really awkward? You know? And I know when I was talking with Pat, he said he had the same thing and he did this kind of like world tour where he went around and met a whole bunch of makers. And he said, some of them were really awkward and weird. Um, and others were Mm. great. Well, when I went to the Aussie maker group meetup, it was the exact same thing. I was terrified. I like, I don't know if anyone noticed, but I walked in and then walked straight outside because I didn't know <laughs> one person like James, James and all that weren't there. Like people that I talked to weren't actually there. And I walked in and I walked straight out and I started playing on my phone until I saw someone walk in that I knew the face. And then I came inside and I'm like, okay, I'm in the right spot. Like that. This is someone I know. And like, it was a great night. Like it was really good, but like getting over those nerves and out of my comfort zone to meet random people like that, I I agree. Like I a hundred percent am so terrified to, to meet new people and stuff. I think about like when we had Jimmy dressed on this podcast, I think that was the first time I had really interacted with like, um, at least a maker who I like really looked up to someone who I felt like was levels above me. Um, and I was nervous before he came on and then he came on and it was, you get these butterflies of like, oh my God, it's happening. You kind of trip over your words, yeah. but then very quickly or not, not quickly, but like within the course of 30 minutes or an hour, things become more natural. And after that, you know, we had more sort of big guests on and on into the spotlight. We had Jacko and with like each of those experiences and then meeting people in person as well, like it just became, um, a little bit easier and just like oh you know these are all just people definitely and just uh, this yeah. happens to be a person that i've seen a lot of their content definitely. and i agree I, and i think it's one of those things that i i don't think they probably like i i've i know i've talked to a few people who went oh i was like afraid to come on clamp i'm like what were you afraid to come on clamp for right? <laughs> but they probably have the same sort of thoughts it's like hey you know these are people i've been listening to i've watched a lot of their content they're you know, I'm just some dude on Instagram. I'm sure they've, I, I just go like, but we're just, we're just people, right? And everyone else Absolutely. is just people too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a weird thing when people say stuff like that, like about us. And I'm like, I'm, I'm nobody. Like, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> I feel like uncomfortable situations, like a lot of personal growth it comes down to like momentum. And I think about like this month for me, which has been is and has been very busy with getting these projects out and moving and amidst like visiting family and going on these vacations and things. Um, and, you know, I was like nervous about it leading up, but as I've started doing things and like maybe making these, like just doing these difficult tasks or things that I might've built up in my head very quickly, like they diminish in size and 
I do one thing and I'm like, oh, I, now I can do all these other things because I realized that that was way smaller than I, than it was before. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's nice when you're in that time when you can just like keep going and do a bunch of uncomfortable things and, and you realize like how much you're truly capable of. For sure. Um, I want to take it back just a little bit. You were talking about like making new projects you've never done before and getting any comfort zone in that way. And it made me think about like, say the van build and stuff. Yeah. Okay. I've never made a van before, but I've made tables. I've made, like I've cut wood. I know how to screw wood together, like that sort of stuff. You take now where I am with the motorbike. I've never owned a motorbike. I've pulled a motorbike apart once and painted it and got it like little, like the, I got the wheels back on the frame essentially with the handlebars. I got no like mechanic stuff done back to it because I didn't know what to do. And now that I'm trying to do stuff with my motorbike now that I've never done before, I am so far out of my comfort zone. It's not funny. So I have a video coming up where I pretty much black out the entire front end of my, my motorbike. Like I paint the forks and the handlebars and all that sort of stuff. My original plan was to pull the whole front end apart, paint everything individually, put it back together. I was so terrified to pull my handlebars apart because I like where they are. I was worried I was never getting them back where they're supposed to be and all that sort of stuff that I ended up just taping off what I didn't want painted and painting the handlebars while they're still on the bike. So you didn't get out of your comfort zone. <laughs> no growth exactly. for Adam. Exactly. Exactly. And, and in saying that, I still am going to paint my engine and I am terrified to pull it out of the bike that I'm probably going to do it. Tape up you got to do it because there's nothing better than getting deep in the weeds of something. And after that experience, understanding it intimately more than you ever could by like studying it or looking at it from third person. Yeah. I think I learned that in my engineering degree. Like when I got really difficult assignments and I was like, I don't know how to do this. And you just start and there, there's this concept in engineering and math called first principles, which is basically when you take something, when you take a complicated concept like stress or, you know, not, not stress, let's say like the deformation of concrete, right? And you bring it all the way back to like, Newton's laws of physics and being able to take that all the way back and understand how each of those steps works forward is so satisfying. And it, it's very empowering too. It makes you realize like, Oh, I can, I can do any engineering. It just might take a really long time, but I understand how all this stuff works. And I feel like those are the sort of experiences you get, you only get when you go super deep into a project and you maybe spend way more time than you ever planned to. I think that's the big, the big issue. And maybe it's an excuse, but is the time. I was so worried that one, I couldn't get it back together, especially with pulling the engine out. What if I can't put it back together because I don't know what I'm doing? I know it's literally the reverse of what you do to take it out, but you know, I'll probably get stuck. And two, I don't want to have the bike out of commission for a week or a longer because I get stuck and then I can't ride it. Like I pretty much ride my motorbike every single day. Every day when I go to the gym, I ride to the gym and I, I guess I'm worried that I can't ride the bike and I want to ride the bike every day. So, but I, again, that could just be an excuse because I don't want to get out of my comfort zone. It's definitely, it's, it, it, it comes up, that comes up with me all the time is like, I'll find a reason that seems yeah. very logical to not do something like, <laughs> and then I'll use that as a crutch on why I can't do this uncomfortable thing. Yeah. Right? But I also think like that is a valid reason to not want to take it apart. I don't think that you will get so stuck that you won't be able to put it back together. Like as long as you're not rushing, but you know, like in those scenarios where you're making excuses to not do something, you have to ask yourself like, is this an excuse or is this a real reason? Maybe you just need another bike. Maybe you should get a project bike so you can ride your other bike around. That is also my thinking as well is like, I don't see this bike is like, it's not fancy. It's not powerful. Like it's a beginner basic bike. And I'm just trying to make it just a little bit nicer than what it is. I don't like the handlebars aren't perfect because I didn't pull them apart, but I don't care from a distance. It looks fine. I don't care that it doesn't look perfect up close for myself. I'm not going to be like putting it into shows or anything like that. But I'm thinking when I upgrade to like my big boy bike, I want to do it properly. I want to pull everything out and I don't know 
how I want to do it because I already have a buyer for the bike I have now that when I buy my big boy bike, I don't, I mean, I, again, I'm going to have a bike that I can ride around while I have that one in pieces. But I'm hoping in a year's time when I do upgrade that I'm past that aspect of like, I must ride every day. Like I, I know I'll still have the passion, but I won't mind having like a month of right. not riding. It's not going to be new anymore. Exactly. Yeah. That's like me with the one wheel right now. I'm just like looking for excuses to one wheel around. And I, I even like, it's not like I go on like super long trips, but I'm like, oh, anyone, uh, this is actually very apparent when we were at, uh, in the Cape and my parents' house is in a fantastic location. It's basically like a two minute walk to the water. So we'd be at the beach. I'm like, anyone need anything? You know, going back to the house, uh, basically just looking for excuses <laughs> to go on short little jaunts back and forth. It's so That's much me fun. with the motorbike, yeah. Yeah. But we went um, we went out the other day to putt-putt and sand pin bowling. And my wife's, my mother-in-law came along with us. And I was like to my wife, I was like, you know, like with you and the mother-in-law in the car and the two kids in the back, it's going to be really squishy to put something back. <laughs> How about I'll just ride my bike there? And then I can say, I can be on the bike separate and you can take the car. And she's like, oh yeah. Okay. I'm like, any excuse to get on that motorbike. Um, speaking of your one wheel though, your story the other day, you were filming yourself with like a, I'm assuming a GoPro on yeah. a stick. That gave me so much anxiety of filming in public. Oh really? Like just that. Yeah. I was like watching it going, wow, I couldn't like, I would be so worried people are going to be looking at me like, look at that guy over there thinking he's so cool on his one wheel filming himself. Like, Well, I mean, yeah. it's funny that you say that because I might, I might've had a smidge of that feeling, but because it's just a GoPro on a stick and it's so small, like that, that was pretty small. The larger feeling is just riding the one wheel at all because it's still a relatively yeah. uncommon like mode of transportation. And so I get looks even in a city like Toronto, like I get looks all the time going by like there is a certain stereotype of a person riding an electric skateboard around a city. Um, yeah. So uh, mm. you, it, it's actually kind of well, good even, in a way because it makes me like, like I am that person. There's no, to literally use it, I have to be that person. So there's no hiding. There's no, there's no getting around it. I just have to get over that discomfort. Yeah. Even like, you know, like you got the um, electric bikes to hire, like the push bikes with the, you can hire them. I don't know what they're called. There's, yeah, like a rentable electric bike. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like they got scooters and stuff as well. We don't have the scooters yet. I think they're coming in. But like the bikes here are so new to us. Like it's they've only been around for like a month or two that it's still a little bit douchey to hire one and ride it around because it's it's so uncommon to see someone on one. Whereas yeah. I think in like say like LA and that they've been around for so long that it's just everyone uses them. It's not uncommon. I, know, I think <laughs> this isn't, I don't know if this is the healthiest way of thinking about it, but it is one way. And that is when I think about someone judging someone else for a choice they are making in their own life that is victimless, that has no negative impact to anyone else. That is a person that like, I don't want to hang out with, that I don't want to spend time with yeah. and, and that I probably don't like. So I think thinking about it in that way, that makes me feel a little bit better about doing these like public acts that... I might think of as embarrassing because I'm like, why do I care if whatever, you know, person feels uncomfortable because I'm living my best life? You know, I think that's yeah. a good way to think about it. I, so I was watching, um, welcome to Wrexham today. And one of the football players on there was saying that memories, um, memories fade and memories are like distant past and you need to live in the moment. And it really hit me of like, who cares about like making memories? Let's worry about like living where we are right now, like spending time with my kids and being happy. I'm not going to remember like in a week's time, oh, I did this instead of spending time with my kids or, or anything like that. Like just being in the moment is so much more important than trying to make a memory. Yeah. Agreed. I, don't, I, don't. I guess I look at it and go. Being in the moment is how you make the memories, but I think but I know that's what you're the trying thing, to though. say. Like the, <laughs> yeah, like the, mem the memories come from it, whereas trying to actually like kind of script a memory right. is not the right way to yeah. go about it. 
I, I agree. It's more a, a lot of people try and like plan too much. And I think it's because they don't want to get Definitely. outside of their comfort zone. And yeah. it's mm. like they over plan and over like script everything. And it's like, I got, I know that I'm one of those people. I had 15 minute <laughs> intervals booked for our, like me and Abby drove out to Newfoundland and I had like 15 minute intervals booked of like, this is when you can shower. Here's your 15, right? From eight to eight fifteen. From eight fifteen to eight thirty, we're eating breakfast. From eight thirty to eight forty five, we're packing up the trailer and we're on the road at nine. Right? Like I had that written out on a schedule. Because I, we, yeah. I was going outside of my comfort zone on driving across the country. I also didn't want to be outside of my comfort zone on the laissez faireness of uh mm. just going with the flow. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a plan, but you, you need to accept that like plans might change and there's going to be flexibility in it. Like if there's anything I learned running a summer camp, it's that plans are fantastic, <laughs> but you need to accept that they're going to, they're probably not going to go according to plan. So this reminds me of um, something that Brian House said last time when you guys had him on. And it was something he learned from Gary V. And the quote is document, don't create, which I resonated so much because I find myself experiencing that, especially in these like public filming videos that I've been doing. No, not even that, even when I'm just filming by myself, sometimes like, like I said, with the palette table, like the second one that I made, I knew that certain moments were going to happen and I would find myself like planning for them and thinking what I was going to say to the camera. But whenever I go through the footage and start editing the video, the better moments are always the one where I'm like reacting genuinely or saying something real in the moment that's not scripted and mm -hmm. it's it's kind of like just letting go of uh the need to control a little bit because it's trusting that like you'll say say the right thing as long as you're kind of in the mindset of like oh i am making it a video i need to be speaking what i'm thinking out loud um and and trusting the process in a way but that super resonated me with me when he was talking about that because i think that when i document more than i create as, at least in the filming side it, i think it makes my videos better do you guys have any other things that you want to talk about to about getting outside of your comfort zone i think when you are about to do something that is uncomfortable it's very easy to jump to the worst case scenario but it's always important to remember that the absolute worst case scenario is extremely unlikely and the more likely scenario is that things will go mediocre and mediocre is usually absolutely. Fun. I always jump to the best case scenario. That's that's what I always do. I just think about the best case scenario, and then I go, "Well, that sounds scary as you know as fuck, anyways." So, <laughs> best case that's scenario. That's a whole other is, topic, right? I go, so I go meet uh, Pat Lap and Jimmy, and best case scenario is somehow I'm wrapped up in a TV show on Netflix. That sounds scary <laughs> as fuck, right? Like. <laughs> Uh, have you guys ever seen um this tv show that steve-o did uh, no. it must have been like 10 15 years ago and it was literally about taking people out of their comfort zone and getting over their like fears of like there was i remember the one that resonates with me is a guy was so worried about public speaking and he made the guy like go stand on the corner with the megaphone and like do a public speech and it was like the whole show was literally just, I'm going to come kidnap you and make you do the thing that you're worried about. Hmm. That's awesome. Crazy. Wow. Mm. I want to watch that. Sounds like a great show. I'm going to it. Sounds like it that would have been show. it. I remember he shaved someone's hair off. <laughs> I can't remember, remember what for though. I think that would have been a very good clamp mendation, but we're not at that part yet. Instead, I'm going to thank our Patreon supporters. And I want to thank the F Clamp level, Brent Jarvis from Clean Cut Woodworking, Vincent Ferrari from Handmade by Vincent Ferrari, Austin from the High Caliber Craftsman, Scott Orm from Dad It Yourself DIY, and Joe Herdina. Thank you very much to all of you. There's still a couple spots left at the F Clamp level. If you want to join that, you can go over to patreon.com slash clamp. And you'll get access to the pre-show and after show, as well as a, a little leather keychain numbered by Morley himself. If you can't support at the F clamp level, there's other levels available like the spring clamp and C clamp levels. 
Uh, you can find all the information there again, patreon.com slash clamp. Clamp Mendations. Uh, my clamp nation for this week is going to be a video by a YouTube channel called Brick Technology. And essentially they made uh, Lego play drums. So they got, uh, I think they're called piezo pickups and they're like little pads that um, like when you touch them, they make, they essentially like um, send a signal to mm-hmm. whatever it is. And then they wire it all up and essentially it plays drums like on the computer sort of thing. Mm. And they make like a conveyor belt with little pegs sticking out of Lego, like an entire Lego conveyor belt. And as it goes through, it plays a song and it's really cool. Sweet. It's like, okay, go. Pretty much, yeah. Sweet. Um, my client mendation. So I was finding myself dissatisfied with my wireless mic. So for a long time, I've been using the Rode Wireless Go, which is a wireless mic paired with a transmitter. So you've probably seen them in a lot of YouTube videos. People clip them on to their lapels or onto their hats. You can also plug a lav mic into it, but it has an onboard mic as well. And then it transmits that signal to a receiver, which you plug into your camera. And one of the main reasons that I was not satisfied with it was in times when it's not just me speaking, when there's other people around as well, it's really difficult to capture all the audio because I have to constantly move the mic back and forth. There's always someone who's too quiet. So I, I wanted at least another mic with two transmitters. That was the main thing. So I started looking at the Rode Wireless Go 2, which we had used at the Steam project. It's basically the same thing, but with two transmitters. And I put out a story of being like, hey, anyone have any... Uh, microphone recommendations. And a bunch of people recommended the DJI mic, which came out recently. And this thing is absolutely incredible. So I bought it after reading about how amazing it is. And it essentially has every feature that I would want in a microphone. So it has two transmitters. It can either receive the audio pre-mixed or in two separate tracks, which is super handy when you want to mute the track separately. It just gives you tons of flexibility. They come in like an AirPod style uh, magnetic charging case, which is so handy. And the added benefit of that is you don't actually have to really turn them on. The same way of like AirPods and other wireless headphones with those magnetic cases, when you open the case, they sort of automatically turn on. You put them back in the case, you close it, and they turn off. So it's incredibly user-friendly. You can record on board onto each of the microphones without a camera. And there's like a single button to touch to do that. Um, There's a touch screen on the receiver. The screen is very well placed. It's just incredibly well designed. It's like every feature that I felt was lacking in the Rode Wireless Go and the Rode Wireless Go 2 because I've used it. um, I feel like the DJI mic does really, really well. It's smaller than the Rode. It's also, um, you don't have to clip it on. It comes with like this cool magnet attachment. So you can kind of like magnet it to your shirt. Um, So... Yeah, if you're looking for a wireless mic, it's it's really good. I would recommend it. Cool. You can find a link for that in the show notes. Did you know that we have links for everything in the show notes? We do. I'm going to recommend that everyone go check out Joiners Handcrafted. Um, it is a guy. Uh, his name's Alex Joiner. If if you can, you know, be. Uh, That's just, you know, his actual last name, but he is not a joiner. He's actually a wood carver and he makes a lot of really cool wood carvings. Uh, Right now he's getting into his Halloween phase. Um, He does a lot of Santas. So if you're into that, you can check it out. Um, And he does uh, just some amazing little wood carvings. So go check him out. At this point, we're going to do, we're not going to be doing the slang of the week because we're doing Morley Reads a Review. Glad I researched for it. Yeah. Well, you should have looked at the notes. (laughs) All right, here we go. Speaking of getting out of your comfort zone. Yeah. The review that Grant copied such that uh, an accent does the alt code in the text, which is Uh, always fun to try to read around, but I think I fixed it. (laughs) Okay. uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's not me. It's, it's iTunes. Here we go. Five stars. 
Love the conversation and stories, especially refreshing to listen to English speakers from not the typical two countries. Salud a Strauss from a Spanish speaker in Switzerland with a Spirish accent. Figure it out. And then it's the emoji with someone sticking their tongue out of their mouth. Also, not an oh, Apple man. user, borrowing someone else's iTunes. And then it's a, a halo emoji, like an angel. Because only angels would borrow someone else's iTunes. And that's from N-D-J-C-B-D-O in Switzerland. Thank you. I, I wanted you to pronounce colon P. Colon and- P. <laughs> I got I to gotta differentiate myself from the AIs in some ways. You know, I, I do have a little yeah. bit of human intelligence. Fair enough. Well, that, thank you so much uh, from the Spanish speaker in Switzerland. We're, we're not actually sure who you are, but thank you for listening and thank you for your spirish, ac- spirish accent. Uh, can't wait to hear if it was good or not. Message us on the uh, Clampcast Instagram. I want to thank TF Turning for the theme song. If you like the new theme song, let us know. If you don't like it, you can let us know too. I don't know. We probably won't change it for like another year. Uh, (laughs) You can find us all together on Clampcast on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, on your favorite podcast player, which is probably how you're listening to us right now. And until next time, cheers and have a great day. Bye. Bye.